in a simple message, feeding dry food does completely against the laws of nature. You know, you're feeding a dehydrated food to a dehydrated animal that is designed to get 80% of its moisture from its food. So you're interfering with the laws of nature, you're interfering with the biology of the animal. Um, this is how you create FLUTD. I'm not sure what you call it these days. We just call it FUS in the old days. Fetal neurological syndrome, basically blockages in male cats that are very lethal. Um, you know, Man-made diseases, basically, from uh, hyper-concentrating these cats. You know, nothing fun about seeing one of these cats present. There's still a really good uh, challenge for most vets to get on top of. Crystals. Now, again, look at cats on raw food. Challenge you to find some crystals in the urine. You just won't see it there. And one of the things that has been proven is that dry food as a general rule doesn't satiate because cats are grazers. Um, you do tend to find that there's a much higher level of obesity in cats that have free access to kibble. Not all, but some. Simply because they don't get the full tummy. I mean, if you're eating the equivalent amount of calories in a dry food would be about maybe two teaspoons compared to two tablespoons of fresh meat. So two tablespoons fills a cat's stomach, they walk away happy. Um, dry food, not happy. Not unless they drink and it swells up, otherwise they're back nibbling at the dry food. So we tend to find there's much more obesity. One thing I don't mention here is that the level of carbohydrate, which is probably the really important one, um, level of carbohydrate in cat food is way too high. Um, you know, cats have basically about a 5% requirement for carbohydrate in their diet, if that. Um, your average cat food is 45% carbohydrate. So you can understand why we see so much diabetes in cats now. That's basically, it's a disease that we're creating by exhausting the insulin system. Um, talked earlier about the fact that insulin is not necessarily a hormone just about controlling sugar metabolism. It's actually about metabolizing fat and it's produced in response to too much sugar in the bloodstream. Uh, so easy ways to uh, manage diabetic cats if you catch them early enough is to take them off carbs completely. Um, and you can basically normalize them if you catch them early enough if the damage to the pancreas isn't complete. That's not photoshopped, that's a real patient. Um, yeah, and you look at that and just think, you know, that's just hideous obesity. Um, yeah. I'm sure there are owners who should be slapped over the knuckles for that one. So the concept here is basically to remind ourselves that you know, kibble, dry food, it was made for human convenience. It was never made as a better diet for animals. It was made because it was shelf stable. It was made because we could use up scrap material. It was made because um, you know, we wanted something that was shelf stable. It didn't need refrigeration. It wasn't icky wicky. Um, but at the end of the day, it's a poor compromise on a good biologically appropriate diet for animals that naturally have evolved for millions of years eating a raw food diet, which I'm going to force you to listen to a bit of my diet talk on raw food because I think it's uh, as important for dogs as cats. So we'll click on hey, Bruce, how, how do you make a cat eat a bone mud? How do you make a cat eat a bone? There's a few ways. I mean, the best thing I can possibly suggest is get your cat started day one. So you get your kitten, you're feeding it, basically you're feeding a meat-based diet, you skip a meal, put out a chicken neck or a chicken wing, pull the skin off. If they don't go for it, the second thing I do is get the, and just get the back of the knife and just smash it up, break it up so it's nice and soft um, and juicy and oozing marrow and everything and that often will entice them. Third thing you can do if they're really fighting it is you tie it on a piece of string and you turn it into a hunt game because cats love the pounce and grab. So that's the hunting instinct is strong. So if you turn it into a, you know, and the cat's got to try it and when they finally get it, first thing they do is shove, shake the mouth and you can encourage them that way to basically bring out that hunting instinct and then turn it into a chewing instinct. So it's a bit of work. I mean, if you get them as a kitten, they'll naturally do it. As soon as you put them out, they'll go for it. But if they're trained to dry food, it's a lot of hard work to retrain them. Because if they only eat meat and don't eat bone, they're going to have trouble. Correct. That's why I make products to balance those diets out. I agree. Um, there's no doubt that meat and bone together have a nice balance of calcium and phosphorus. But if you only feed meat, you will end up with calcium deficiency. And you know, it's been a while since I've seen a kitten come in. but I remember, you know, early in my career having a cat that, you know, got its, I can't remember if it was a tail, a paw caught in the door, the woman just sat a tiny bit and snapped, just snapped the leg and we x-rayed it, the quarter seat, so you can hardly see them, and I said, what do you feed the cat? She said, meat. I said, and? So, meat. And, uh, and she just created this cat that was literally ready to snap, because it just, so, you know, unbalanced raw food is bad, no two ways about it, so you, you do need some thought. Um, but it's easy enough to get a uh, correct balance in there, a bit of roughage and a bit of greenery and a few other bits and pieces that we might touch on. But important point, that uh, Mother Nature's source of calcium in the diet is from bones. And Bruce, the other question I have is, 
with the cats that I've got, if you wrestle the crystals in the bladder, <coughs> you would um, feed a raw food and that'll stop that. Long term, yeah. Basically, the thing about it is that when you feed a high meat diet, it acidifies the urine. So all these tablets and products that we use to try and acidify the cat's urine is done naturally by red meat. I mean, if you feed a cat a high, you know, 80% red meat, their pH is between four and five, which just dissolves any crystal and kills bacteria. When you look at a cat that's on a dry food diet, the pH is usually hovering around seven, sometimes higher. And as soon as you reach neutrality or alkalinity, crystals will form. So it's basically a diet-driven disease. Um, and raw meat does it's just a natural acidifier, which is easy, the way it's meant to be, basically. Uh, how about the regular food? Uh, I'm going to quit with this. I can't remember what this one is. Yeah, it's got a few slides in here. So this is a, a summary, I guess, of uh, why we should feed raw food. So this is trying to sort of remind ourselves. Um, evolutionary adaption. Many of us probably don't realise that dogs and cats have been evolving for about uh, 40 million years, 39.98 million years from their earliest uh, common ancestor, uh, Carnivore. Obviously the wolf is still out there and the dingoes are still out there doing it. Um, raw food has autolytic enzymes, by that meaning that it has enzymes within the actual uh, food structure itself that helps to break it down in the gut, so basically it's a pancreas bearing. Um, it is extremely hard to create an obese animal with raw food, basically, because their metabolism is sped up, but also as a general rule, there's a lot less fat, you've actually got to add a lot of fat to create a, a high fat diet, but they metabolise fat extremely well. Dogs and cats are designed to use fat as their primary fuel source. They only get fat when you add carbohydrate and fat together, and the body then selectively uses the carbohydrate and stores the fat. So if you starve them with carbohydrate, they start burning their body fat with uh, tissues, and they use that as fat, and it's far more efficient for the body to do that because you don't produce insulin, and therefore you don't get insulin resistance and diabetes. Um, absolutely no doubt when you look at raw fed animals that their dental health is absolutely superior. Um, you know, I've got a 12 year old dog at home, I put uh, a, a picture of his teeth up on our Facebook site at one point and asked people to guess how old, and they were saying two, three, four, and the oldest might have been six. I said, well, he's 12, turning 13, he's never had any dental work. But he eats fresh meat and he chews on bones twice a week. And that, again, is Mother Nature's toothbrush. Now, when it comes to breeding, I've worked with a lot of breeders over the years. Um, and one thing I've certainly seen is that you can increase fertility and decrease obstetrical issues uh, when you change to raw food. I just have to take my word for that. Uh, improved fecal matter. Again, um, you know, if you've been in practice long enough, you'll know that squeezing anal glands ain't much fun. Um, I get the nurses to do it nowadays for me. Um, but basically, again, it's a condition where there's not enough fecal bulking, so there's no fecal matter. I mean, processed foods and dry foods produce these soft, soft pasty, conveniently small uh, fecal balls, but they don't stimulate the animal glands to empty properly. Um, dogs are designed to eat all sorts of stuff, you know, sticks and nuts and bark and feathers and all sorts of things that bulk up and pass through and come out the other end undigested. And that's actually what stimulates the animal glands to empty properly. And we don't get any other problems with cooked food, which I think is an arm of the lecture, so it must have come after that. Bruce, what sort of bones do you recommend usually? A little bone lecture I will touch on because I think it's really important. Um, particularly now that the Dental Veterinary Association has come out and, you know, whitewashed bones and basically said feeding bones to your dog is dangerous, you shouldn't do it. Um, that's, you know, it's a throwaway line given that dogs have been eating bones for 38 million years. Um, the truth is, if you're smart about how you feed them, there's two golden rules. Number one, raw, that sort of goes without saying. Number two, don't feed weight-bearing bones. So you don't feed your big, long, um, you know, leg bones and, and front and back leg bones. So anything that's got a solid cortex and a nice big marrow tube is basically going to be dangerous to their dog's teeth, cat's teeth, so that's when they break their teeth, that's when you get your slab fractures and your carnassials. Um, I use the axial skeleton. So my favourite is brisket down the front, which is basically soft cartilage, um, ribs, um, you know, bone, neck, neck and tail, uh, basically all good parts of the body, but stay away from your big bones that the butcher will cut up for you, because guaranteed that's when you go to the butcher for a kilo of bones, he'll give you sections of leg or slabbed in half. Um, they are the ones that dogs can break their teeth on, particularly if they lie around the garden for three or four weeks in the hot sun, baked hard, so you end up with a hard bone, that they'll still go back and chew on them, that's when they break their teeth. So you can avoid most of the pitfalls and most of the arguments that veterinary dentists will give you about not feeding teeth, but again, 
if I was a veterinary dentist, I wouldn't want my clients feeding bones. I wouldn't have any work. So it kind of makes sense.